Hi everybody, I'm Rudyard, the guy behind What If All Test, and I'm just here to explain why this video was taken down. So, I released the original version of this video in May or June, and as I did so, it got age-restricted from the moment I released it. And for those that don't know what that means, it means that people under the age of 18 couldn't watch the video. And I thought, this is kind of weird, but I was okay with it. Um, and after that, I asked YouTube why it was age-restricted, because I was very confused. Because the thing is, it's an anthropology video. It's talking about a far-off civilization and what their culture is like. And the other video YouTube tried to age-restrict, and I caught it early and I changed up the content for it, is uh, my first video on American regional cultures. And so I took out a couple words and the video stopped being age-restricted. But I released this video and I asked YouTube why is this age restricted? And then they just took the video down. And that happened at the start of August. I was about to start going on vacation and there was a bunch of other drama going on in my life. And so I'm just getting back to re-releasing it now. And the thing I don't get is very few people were offended by this video. If you go through the old comments, Southeast Asians liked it. Like Southeast Asians were happy that I covered their culture. And I think I was pretty appreciative. Like I said, it was my favorite part of Asia. And it's strange and it's something that if you talk to youtubers this happens a lot where youtube is a very autocratic weird structure where they'll just take stuff down and they won't tell you why and the thing that really got to me for this was they took down this video they did not give me an explanation for what i did wrong and just for some perspective that's something the english-speaking world outlawed in the middle ages that's something magna carta talks about and so youtube is literally a thousand years behind what legal rights should be. And I, and it's just ridiculous that they'll take down videos. And for YouTubers like me, this is our life. Like, this is what we do. And it's just ridiculous that YouTube will just, they have total absolute autocratic power and there's nothing you can do to really check it. And I guess the only thing I can do is tell my fan base and just make people aware that YouTube can't do this. But I mean, when you all get down to it, I'm fine. My life continues as it did before. And I'm re-releasing the video with a couple things edited out for what I think YouTube might not have liked. But again, I think it's completely ridiculous that they're going after my anthropology videos rather than the actually controversial videos I make on political taboos, on civil wars, on major wars, on race, all that stuff. They go after my obscure anthropology videos. And it's just a sign of how YouTube is so irrational and autocratic. And this is something, just talk to a lot of YouTubers. YouTube makes decisions for reasons that don't make a lot of sense to a rational person. But I'll stop whining and you guys can start watching the video. Peace. I lived in Thailand with some friends for a month this last spring and I found it a really fascinating country in a lot of ways. I've been to three countries in Asia, Turkey, China, and Thailand, and I've changed planes in Qatar for all that's worth. Each of these countries were really different from each other in ways that made them feel to me as a Westerner almost like fantasy novels. With the exception of Thailand, however, these were all countries where I understood why they were different. I'd read enough Islamic and Chinese history to look at these cultures and think, this is really bizarre from my Western perspective, but I get it. When I went to Thailand, I was like, what? Honestly, this is a part of the world I fell in love with in a lot of ways and found really compelling. I'd honestly say that Southeast Asia is in competition with Africa for areas history books cover the least. Your average history of the world focuses on the historic trajectory that led to the development of modern Western civilization while throwing in a couple chapters of the big three Asian civilizations of China, India, and the Middle East with a couple paragraphs on Africa. When I went to Thailand, I was entering a culture I just didn't know anything about. This was an area whose culture I found really vibrant, and being the person I am, I immediately read a lot of books in the subject to try to figure out how to crack the area's code. This is my humble attempt to break this often ignored area of the world for foreign viewers. And it's funny that this is, of the main civilizations I've covered, one of the ones I know the least about, but this has turned out to be the longest civilization video so far, because you just have to cover everything because there's so little context that you can assume with people.
Hi everybody, I'm Rudyard, the guy behind What If All Tests, and I love to travel, but there's really a lot that goes into it, from finding a place to stay, to booking flights, finding places to eat, and with everything going on, budgeting can be a real hassle. But with Rocket Money, managing my finances has never been easier. Rocket Money is an all-in-one personal finance manager that helps me keep track of my spending, monitor my credit score, find a way to build up my savings all in a single place. Rocket Money is a great system for budgeting, which I use to help myself keep informed of my spending, keeps me aware of where my money's going. The budgeting's simple and comprehensive, with alerts to notify me of when I'm going over my budget and ordering my spending by category. Rocket Money also allows me to set up a smart savings account. You can choose the amount of money and the frequency, and Rocket Money will automatically deposit the savings into a smart savings account that I can withdraw from at any time. Rocket Money's been great for helping me manage my money while I'm at home or traveling, with several features that are easy to use and great for keeping track of my money. Get started with Rocket Money for free. Hit the link in the description box or head to rocketmoney.com slash whatifalltest. Thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. Southeast Asia is kind of weird in these civilization videos, since in my official map of civilizations, I don't have it as a single civilization, but instead is divided between Islamic, Chinese, Latin American, and Buddhist civilization. Even this complexity doesn't really do this region justice, since you also have to throw in the Protestant hill tribes, Hindu remnants, the inhabitants of New Guinea, and the like. This region is a beautiful panoply of cultures with Indonesia having over 500 spoken languages, just as a short example. However, as I studied this region, I found even though there are differences, these different civilizations share fundamental natures that I think means that they're most usefully studied as a unity, rather than let's say making a single civilization video around the Buddhist civilization of Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, and then making a different video for the Islamic civilizations of Indonesia, Malaysia, etc. Southeast Asians are fundamentally people of the same genetic stock, thus inheriting fundamentally similar cultural foundations, living in similar geographies and sharing thousands of years of some of the most vibrant trade systems in history. In other words, this is a part of the world where even if the region is divided by civilizations and geographies, those civilizations often don't really break through onto the deeper basis of the society. The Buddhist ties have more in common with the Muslim Indonesians than either does with their co-civilizations, supposedly in India or Saudi Arabia. The origins of this shared Southeast Asian world lie in prehistory and events that came around the end of the last Ice Age. 12,000 years ago, when glaciers covered the cities of Boston and Moscow, Southeast Asia was a giant peninsula jutting towards Australia, with the islands of Indonesia being part of the mainland. This area was inhabited by the relatives of the modern Australian aboriginals, who were one of the earliest branches of humans and migrated across southern Asia through India to Australia from Africa. However, with the invention of rice agriculture in central China at the end of the last ice age, there were mass migrations of people from China south into Southeast Asia. These came in two different migrations, the first being the Austronesians, originally from Fujian, who sailed by boat to colonize the Philippines and Indonesia, and then eventually ended up crossing the Pacific as the Polynesians. Meanwhile, the second from the Yangtze Valley, or the Austroasiatics, marched across the land south to settle the mainland of Southeast Asia. In both places, these Chinese these peoples were placed and bred at the local populations, but scattered in the jungles of the region, you see hunter-gatherers who were the remnants of the original aboriginal populations, who are normally politically subservient to the farming peoples in the same way the pygmies are in Central Africa. Southeast Asia shares a lot of cultural norms with other East Asians due to this shared history. For example, being interest in face. In Asian societies, the need to maintain pride in your social image is considered a moral good in of itself. Even more so than, say, China or Japan, who are already very face-driven societies, Southeast Asian societies in many ways are the most face-driven in the world. I've heard many Filipinos don't like to talk about their histories, given that hearing about the Philippines' as previous defeats to foreign powers is dishonoring their country. Going to the Philippines and, say, talking about the Spanish colonization is considered an insult to the nation. I read an interesting book on Thai culture that talked about the common Thai stereotype that Thai people were very friendly and nice was partially since they actually tend to kind people, but also fundamentally that being polite and friendly is part of the cultural consensus to keep the peace, kind of in the way it is with Canada. I was shocked how clean and nice downtown Bangkok is. I'd say much more so than Los Angeles, an area with 10 times the GDP per capita, but this is since the elite in Thailand have a very strong emphasis on presentation and outwards appearance, which Californians really don't. 
Another effect of this is that Southeast Asia is currently going through a massive mental health crisis due to the stresses of modernity, but you would have no idea of this since putting on a calm face is considered a moral good in of itself. I read a book on Thai culture that said that people were expected to conform to their social image, and individuality and personality were viewed as scary and unpredictable. This made a society where it's very easy to get along with your life and relax, but at the same time, there's not a lot of room for intimacy, realness, or depth which in turn creates massive mental health problems, especially with the big changes that come with modernity. I always cover face in these civilization and anthropology videos since it's a concept that's basically totally alien to Westerners, but is a really vital part of life for most of the world's population. I normally do come across as betraying face as negative, which I do stand by, but at the same time, there are positives. I'd like to compare Southeast Asia to another part of the world I've lived in, Mexico. Although Mexico is richer than Thailand, I was shocked at how much nicer Thailand was. I was scared to walk at night in Mexico. You purposely try to keep away from cops there, who are normally thugs, and you were never going to travel by public transport. At the same time, none of that was a problem in Thailand, where everything basically worked. This is a side effect of a culture that cares really deeply about filling social roles. One of the reasons I'm excited to talk about Southeast Asia is that it's basically the opposite of the West in many ways. In psychological cultural surveys, you normally see a gradient for every trait with some countries on each side. Normally the US with the Protestant North European countries on one side of the spectrum, and then Southeast Asia and Japan on the opposite one. I think Southeast Asia is a useful test case of civilizations that evolved with basically opposite conditions of the West. And since the vast, vast majority of the world's not Western, it's important to view them through their own ideas rather than comparing them to the West. It annoys me that in my other civilization videos, it often feels like why this civilization wasn't able to compete with the West, which seems kind of unfair given the West is such an insane outlier in how many of the variables that led up to it went right. With Southeast Asia, we will look at a lot of conditions that don't even touch Europe, but have affected majorities of the human race. One of the important factors of which is rice farming. Southeast Asia is divided into two broad agricultural regions. The highlands and jungles where farming is largely slash and burn, migratory and done by small tribal populations, while the lowlands have cities and countries and based around rice farming. Across the last thousand years, a majority of Southeast Asians lived in these urban rice farming states. Unlike the Orient's Jupiters of India and China, both of which big civilizations are divided between wheat and rice farming areas, Southeast Asia is almost entirely rice farming due to its universally humid tropical climate. Rice farming societies have a couple correlations that powerfully affect Southeast Asia. Rice farming cultures have to be very collectivist, prioritizing the group over the individual, since you need a lot of people to work together in rice agriculture to get anything done. In studies, East Asians view the world in a less linear and causal way, and instead through relationships and holistically. Interestingly, we see this in East Asia's modernization attempts to the West, where they prioritize aesthetics and the general image of modernization, while not, as Westerners would, isolating the particular strengths of different methods. Although rice-based irrigation societies do have some key advantages, with one being they can support truly massive populations, with close to a majority of the world's population coming from one of the rice-based irrigation societies, there are some important disadvantages that we ought to talk about here. I also think this is just since rice farming is probably the most brutal of any type, since you literally work 12 hours a day stooped over, breaking your back, picking little pieces of rice. I find it amusing when people talk about how awful it is for, say, sweatshops in South and East Asia to have their employees work 12 hours a day in unair conditioned conditions, and I'm not going to discount how normally traumatic industrialization is for these societies, but at the same time, people will literally work in those factories illegally and at great effort since basically anything beats rice farming. An important thing to consider with irrigation societies like this is that there are diseases like malaria or ringworm that over 90% of the population has from working in the rice fields, which leave people feeling lethargic for their whole lives. You find that rice farming tropical cultures never expand militarily or geographically for reasons not fully in my understanding. The grain growing norths of India and China normally dominate their rice growing souths. The reason partially for this is the ringworm and malaria I talked about earlier, but on top of that, that rice agriculture requires constant work all year round. There's no off-season for rice agriculture, and rice agriculture involves bending over into muddy ground to pull out tiny grains of rice. Wheat agriculture, meanwhile, is only a couple months a year, and you can take the rest of the year off, and you don't have to bend over as much. 
But at the same time, it means that wheat-based countries can drag their entire or large parts of their male population to war for the summer, which rice-based agricultural countries cannot. I've always been confused why for all of Indonesia's history, the small island of Java had the vast majority of the population, normally overpopulated, but this never resulted in colonization of the neighboring very lightly populated but much larger islands like Sumatra or Borneo. I think a good symbol of this is how Southeast Asia never colonized Australia, which you can either construe as positive or negative depending on your value system. We have a lot of evidence that the Southeast Asians have known about Australia for a thousand years, with Islamic coins found in the region's north coast in the 11th century, and records of selling goods to China during the Middle Ages from areas really close off the Australian coast. Once the British arrived in Australia's north coast in the 1700s, Muslim merchants were already acting in the region in a big way. At the same time, the native Aboriginal people's tribal histories say they were trading with the Muslims. However, even though the Southeast Asians often suffered horrible overpopulation, they didn't populate a vast Australia that was lightly settled by hunter-gatherers who couldn't possibly defeat them. Instead, a tiny nation in the North Atlantic on the exact opposite side of the world populated Australia. Another geographic condition that bears mentioning is heat. I've never seen heat as bad as I did in Thailand. Like when I used to live outside Cancun, which is also really, really hot, I would jog every morning. I tried that in Thailand, even jogging at midnight, and I just couldn't because it was so hot and humid. My mom's Canadian and I partially grew up there, and experiencing both the horrible Canadian winters and the brutal Thai sun has made me realize how much climate influences personality of history, which was an accepted historical premise for almost all of history, until basically the invention of the air conditioner made the idea that climate had no influence on history acceptable over the last few decades. In a climate like Canada, even in the summer, you're always aware of the winter, in which some deep part of you thinks you'll starve. I remember having a hailstorm in July with temperatures around 40 degrees Fahrenheit outside Toronto. Over the horrible winters, you basically sit inside and work since you have to do something or you'll get depressed. In Thailand, they host markets at night since the day is so hot. In most climates, if I see a mountain, I want to climb it. In Thailand, I just looked at the mountain and thought there's no way I'm climbing that in this weather. I don't want to deal with the nine-foot spitting cobras either. The historian Amory Duryakur compares how temperate and tropical climates view the natural world. Temperate climates like China or Europe view nature as naturally beautiful, but also something to be tamed by human exertion. Meanwhile, tropical climates like India view nature as an often cruel thing to accept partially due to the oppressive heat, but also the frequency of awful diseases and the far greater number of poisonous and deadly animals. This is part of the reason why most of Southeast Asia fell in the sphere of Indian cultural influence, given that they shared a fundamental climate with tropical India, at least more so than temperate China, which leads us to the next segment. Probably the greatest mariners in world history came out of Southeast Asia. Starting in the Stone Age, the Austronesians mastered the oceans of this region, stretching from Madagascar to South America. Sailing in dugout canoes without modern technology, these peoples, of whom the Polynesians are a branch, would routinely cross thousands of miles of open ocean to reach new islands. They became a bedrock for an ocean-facing world that is the origin of Southeast Asia. As a fun side note, the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa was originally settled by people from Borneo, and so, in a lot of ways, should be viewed as an extension of Southeast Asian society. And afterwards, you had migrations of Africans into Madagascar, but the social system on that island remained fundamentally Indonesian, and one of the coolest things about it is that there's actually an oral tradition, kind of like the Iliad or the Vinland sagas, that talks about how they came over in the centuries around the birth of Christ, crossing thousands of miles of water, and actually originally sailed to East Africa, then couldn't settle there due to disease, then settled and built their society on the island of Madagascar. The settlement of Southeast Asian peoples in Madagascar precipitated a massive technological shift in all of Sub-Saharan Africa, in that the Madagascar peoples introduced bananas as well as new kinds of cattle and ironworking into East Africa that precipitated large population growth and growth in new kingdoms and development. An interesting fact is that the Latin sail that the Europeans developed for the Age of Exploration was invented in Southeast Asia by the Austronesians and then spread west through the Islamic world until it reached Europe. The Austronesians created trade connections stretching between Japan, India, Africa, and China, thus tying the eastern seas together. 
It's important to view this whole oceanic region between Kenya and Japan as a single sea, since that's really how it's worked across history, with cultures, trade, and people spreading across its waters with ease. This area is peculiar given how important the monsoon is. What happens if that for part of the year the monsoon blows one direction really powerfully and the other time of the year it blows the other? Months of rain slam into the region between India and China due to seasonal rain patterns. This has made navigation in this region pretty easy, where you pick what time of the year you want to cross the region and then ride the monsoon. This has meant that even though the sailors in this region were often really impressive, they never developed boats for harsh waters. Marco Polo in the 13th century, upon seeing the boat he would sail to China across the Indian Ocean from Iraq, was horrified by what he viewed as a creaky reed boat, instead deciding to walk to China overland. But due to the waters of the Indian Ocean being pretty easy to sail, he would have made it to China in all likelihood. The first big external influence to get involved in this region were the Indians. India developed an advanced civilization very early, and Indian traders started to penetrate the coasts of Southeast Asia in the centuries after the birth of Christ. This then resulted in almost the whole region becoming a cultural extension of Indian civilization. The rulers called themselves Indian titles like Raja, they converted their countries into Hinduism or Buddhism, or a combination of both, while writing with Indian scripts and following Indian fashions. We see a selection of coastal elites develop across the region like Funan, Pagan, or in Java in the first millennium AD. These societies were dependent upon foreign trade, largely exchanging the goods from the tribal groups in their hinterlands to the giant civilizations of India and China, with the coastal cities acting as trade depots. China was the beating heart of the pre-modern world's economic system, and funnily enough you can trace the rise and fall of states in this area of the world based off how the Chinese economy was doing. The spread of civilization was pretty similar to what happened in Africa, in which peaceful traders, Muslim in Africa's case and Indian in Southeast Asia's, showed up, made the regions economically dependent on trading luxury goods to bigger civilizations. Then with money from the trade, you saw the formation of centralized governments, who were normally slave states, that used the revenues to keep armies who then converted to the hegemonic religions of the merchants of the bigger civilizations that they're working with in order to get a cultural tradition to base a government around, and honestly government bureaucrats be able to manage their new centralized nations. In both Southeast Asian and African situations, locals said they were part of the broader civilizations of the merchants as a way of showing their worldliness, while travelers to those regions from the bigger civilizations viewed the local population as basically heretics and barbarians. We have records of Indians and Chinese going to Southeast Asia and often being shocked at how much their cultural traditions had mutated to local conditions. In many ways, this was positive, in that through the process of peaceful selection, the bad traits of the bigger Chinese, Indian, or Islamic civilization were ignored. The caste system never took hold in a real way in Southeast Asia. Vietnam has never had tyrants as bad as China, or the Muslims of Southeast Asia have never had the excesses of Middle Eastern theocracies. I even remember how shocked a lot of Protestant missionaries were in Southeast Asia when the local peoples mixed their local customs with Christianity, and when the American missionaries criticized them, the Southeast Asians say that nothing they're doing is against anything written in the Bible. Instead, the West inherited cultural and situational heritage. You you generally saw Hinduism lose out over the region over the last thousand years, with only a few islands left like Bali, with Buddhism and Islam winning out, given that Hinduism is a religion with thousands of gods and is probably the most complex philosophy of any religion, which has many strengths, but one of the weaknesses that comes with it is that it's very difficult to convert non-Indian peoples who don't come from the cultural context where those thousands of gods and their many, many sub-avatars make sense. Buddhism and Islam, with their single sentence summaries of awakening from Dukkha and there's only one god and Allah's prophet, are a lot easier sells to culturally distinct peoples. Water travel is uniquely important to Southeast Asia and the development of states there since jungles are horrible. I don't know how else to say this, but anyone who's walked in a jungle knows how really terrifying it is, where you can't carve a path through the walls of foliage, and you're all looking at cobras and table-sized spiders, and that all makes ocean-based travel a lot more appealing, and also is the reason why this is one of the very few places where advanced civilizations developed in the jungle. Having walked 600 miles in the Appalachian Trail in the American Mid-Atlantic, I can tell you the woods of temperate climates are playing life on an easy mode. At the same time, Southeast Asia was really in a good position for what it got from oceanic travel. 
During the Middle Ages, the Indian Ocean trade routes were the largest and most prosperous in the world. European visitors like Marco Polo were often just completely speechless at the amount of wealth and traffic that sailed through the monsoon seas. They saw everything from ships leaving Arabia with horses, frankincense and myrrh, Indians exporting manufactured goods, and China being the largest luxury market in the world, spitting out stuff like ceramics and silk. The trade in this region was dependent upon luxuries, and that was the main tilt of the economies in some ways until today. Southeast Asia has always been globalized. The biggest change that came over this Indian Ocean world before European colonialism was Islam spread to convert almost all of maritime Southeast Asia, including the unbelievably massive region of modern Indonesia, Malaysia, and parts of the Philippines and Thailand. If you look at maps of world history, this really makes no sense. Wait. How did the Muslims jump from the Arabian Peninsula thousands of miles away to dominating the Malay Archipelago? However, when you view the Indian Ocean as a giant unit that connects things rather than as a barrier, it makes sense. You have to keep in mind the trade routes across this region were in many ways dominated by Persians, Omanis, and Gujarati merchants who were all Muslim, and through their trade influence were able to convert this region. I'd largely blame this upon the decay and decadence of Hinduism in the Indic world. Hinduism became more puritanical over the Middle Ages, creating various prescriptions that ended up turning all the edges of the Indic world, whether Pakistan, Bangladesh, or maritime Southeast Asia, to Islam. Some of these weird prescriptions were that you couldn't leave India and remain a good Hindu, or crossing the Salt Sea or dealing with non-Hindus would pollute you and hurt your reincarnations, which is just a perfect way to piss off merchants who dominated this region. The peoples of Southeast Asia weren't exactly keen on the caste system either, which the Muslims actively stood against. In the late Middle Ages and the early modern period, as the merchants turned to Islam, the trade-dependent regions of maritime Southeast Asia converted to Islam. There's a really fascinating book called Strange Parallels by Victor Lieberman that talks about how you see the exact same patterns of state formation in Western Europe as in Southeast Asia. How in both cases you saw the modern states of the region develop around 1000 AD, and then afterwards have a collapse around the Black Death, followed by the formation of bureaucratic states that again fell apart in the 17th century to be replaced by absolutist monarchies, which in turn had a collapse in the 18th century, like the French Revolution, followed by the rise of a non-aristocratic conqueror in Thailand like Napoleon. The biggest reason for this is that you can trace these parallels across almost every place in the world. I've talked ad nauseum before about Turchin cycles on this YouTube channel, but it's still worth repeating how for demographic and macroeconomic reasons that the world order collapses roughly every few centuries. At the same time, for a bunch of reasons, around 1000 AD was when more developed bureaucratic urban societies pushed away from the classical core around 40 degrees north to northern Europe, West Africa, Japan, Central Asia, a lot of the Americas, and yes, Southeast Asia. The trend we saw develop in mainland Southeast Asia was the formation of states and river valleys a little up from the malarial coastlines. This included the Ava state in Burma and the Khmer Empire based out of Cambodia that controlled most of the area. Burma has remained a country developing a strong national identity that's basically unbroken for the last thousand years. Meanwhile, due to economically and technologically falling behind, the Cambodian Khmer Empire was gradually destroyed and eaten up by Thai tribes coming down from southern China, who formed a nation of Thailand that by the 18th century had become by far the most powerful nation in the region, owning the modern countries of Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. Vietnam is in a lot of ways an outlier, and is included in both my Southeast Asian and Chinese civilization videos. Vietnam was a colony of China's from around the 1st century BC to 1000 AD, after which the Vietnamese gained independence and have since fought off 27 Chinese invasions. The Vietnamese are one of the most remarkable nations militarily for this reason. Vietnam's also kind of strange in that, like Canada, it's built so much of its identity off maintaining independence from its bigger neighbor, while at the same time in the process of being in that bigger country country's orbit, it continually imbibes their culture and civilization. Ironically, in Vietnam's case, this was done by the Vietnamese elite, who took Chinese cultural forms as a way to make Vietnam stronger so it could fight China. Southeast Asia is kind of strange as world cultures go in that it's sandwiched between two areas with much greater populations and much longer histories. I sometimes like to measure how advanced governments are based off when they start having professional armies. In India and China, this was around 300 BC. In Southeast Asia, it was around 1500 AD, nearly 2,000 years later. This region has been called Indochina or Cochin China, Cochin's an old term for South India, since it developed late enough that it was unable to really form an independently generative cultural force to balance out being the orbit of the two sons of the Orient. 
India and China. However, in the early modern period, we saw the Southeast Asian nations gain more confidence, for example, going very strongly for Buddhism while India went Hindu, or forming successful, well-orchestrated nations while integrating foreign cultures on their own terms. We have records of a king of a pretty geographically small kingdom in South India sending a message to the king of Thailand in the 70th century, in which the Indian king said, Although the king of Thailand rules a kingdom that's larger than mine in land, I rule over men while the Thai king rules over mosquitoes and jungle. This was indicative of the sheer differences in population density, caused by geography, in which Southeast Asia had a much lower population density than either India or China. These geographic factors being that the jungles and the swamps were much harder to break through in Southeast Asia than India or China, and that Southeast Asia didn't have the broad, flat, fertile plains to anywhere close to the same degree as China or India. This totally dominated the politics of the area and how it developed. Until basically the 20th century, the nations of Southeast Asia were lightly settled frontier states. It's just that the frontier had been there for centuries and wasn't being steamrolled like the Native Americans had been in America, or the nomadic tribes in Central Asia by the Russians. Just like any other frontier, we see the two competing tendencies of freedom and servitude. This is since when you don't have a lot of people, the logic is either that you let everyone do what they want, or make everyone do what you want. In Southeast Asia, we see these dynamics between the hill peoples to the north of Southeast Asia, or the peoples in the insides of the big islands, and the peoples in the urbanized rice paddy civilizations. There's a really fascinating book on the subject called The Art of Not Being Governed by James C. Scott, which looks at these complex dynamics from the perspective of the illiterate hill peoples rather than the governments. The states of Southeast Asia developed off slave labor. Although it wouldn't surprise me if this is an oversimplification, about a third of Thailand's population in the 18th century were slaves, with similar conditions across the region. In many ways, this is since Southeast Asia didn't border a region with really powerful barbarians, and that need to get troops to fight the barbarians was a big reason coercive slave states were abolished in the rest of Eurasia. At this time, the Southeast Asian states, irrespective of whether they became Confucian or Islamic, were all operating off pretty authoritarian Indian royal models. A lot of the slavery was really brutal, where in early modern Burma and Thailand, for example, at least they would brand the foreheads of slaves and serfs so they couldn't run away. Or a lot of the currency in this social world was with female sex slaves, and a big reason why Thailand and Bali are known for their sex work today is because elite males would trade young girls as a sexual currency between them. The dynamic here was between the centralized slave states which gained power through their organizational abilities and over time expanded to control more and more of the region, until by the time of the 18th century, all of mainland Southeast Asia had been divided between various bureaucratic states. The states stole slaves from the mountain tribes while also trading for luxury resources that came from the jungle hinterlands that were the mainstays of their foreign trade. Meanwhile, the barbarians periodically conquered these states when they were weak and oppressed villagers routinely fled in the mountains, where the tribes were proud to be barbarians as that entailed a freedom that didn't exist in the valleys. We see this dynamic even today where the centralized government tries to control the various ethnic minorities and incorporate them to the machine that is the state. Look at Burma where the dominant Burmese ethnicity is waging a permanent war to subjugate the minorities like the Karen, I'm not making that name up, the Mon, the Kachin, as well as committing genocide against the Muslim Rohingya. You see similar dynamics in basically every single Southeast Asian nation, whether with the Hmong in Vietnam, the Karen or Malays in Thailand, the New Guineans, Akanese and a bunch of others in Indonesia, as well as Sarawak and the Chinese in Malaysia, for a couple examples. As of now, almost every nation in Southeast Asia is fighting a series of wars on its frontiers to control various hill tribes. An important thing I can't leave out is the importance of religion, which is decisive in the development of every region. In areas, the Buddhist monasteries or Hindu temples were the economic dynamos pushing the areas. Some of these countries, with Burma as an example, were able to get very high literacy rates in the early modern period through the influence of Buddhist monks on society. It's easy to lambast the brutality of these assimilation campaigns, and they are undeniably evil and cruel, but you have to keep in mind that these sort of military campaigns attached to cultural assimilation are basically how every country in the world is formed. It's just that the Western countries had the decency to do it centuries ago when there weren't human rights tribunals. I mean, my nation, the United States, is built off defeating, enslaving, or assimilating the natives, Africans, French, Mexicans, Southerners, only a little bit more than a century ago. One of the things that makes me optimistic about Southeast Asia is that it's one of the few areas in the tropics, like Latin America, that's been able to build national identities from the ground up. 
In the 14th century, there was no Thai nation, with the Thais themselves being a ruling aristocracy coming down from China, like the Normans in England. But over the next 300 years, they were able to assimilate the Mon, Lahu, Mele, Karen, Shan, and other peoples of the Cheo Phraya Basin into a single national identity that's undeniably Thai now. I see this with Indonesia and the Philippines today, who leave with a dilemma both of which are very recent nations established by European colonialism. I think the Philippines will remain a single nation due to its compact geography, but I consider Indonesia a massive toss-up on whether or not it survives the next century. On one side, Indonesia has a naturally horrible deck of cards in its hands, with a truly massive nation that stretches with hundreds of islands the distance from London to Kyrgyzstan without really having a good navy. This country has over 500 languages and the Dutch colonizers put no effort into establishing institutions in the region, leaving the local elites with a hard job. However, Indonesia has done possibly the best job of any nation since World War II of building a national identity by using a merchant's language like Swahili in East Africa as lingua franca, constructing a shared ideology and identity around Sunni Islam and Malay ethnicity. However, can this good precedent of leadership offset all the cards stacked against them over the inevitable trials of the next century will bring? Indonesia is a good microcosm of state formation in Southeast Asia, in which it is precariously tipping between forming a successful nation that lasts forever and gradually expands or collapsing like the Khmer, Srivijaya, or Majapahit. However, the struggles Indonesia faces as a modern nation are immediately related to the next point in Southeast Asia's development, colonialism. There were two different trajectories of European imperialism in Southeast Asia, the first being the maritime region that was colonized very early, and then the mainland nations that were colonized later and much more briefly by the Europeans. Southeast Asia in some ways has the same problem as Latin America, and the borders kind of make too much sense. In both areas, the nations are built around a central fertile area, with its borders and barely passable jungles, swamps, and mountains, meaning this region's warfare was a lot less intense than in other areas of Eurasia. At the same time, the neighboring civil Civilizations of India and China weren't expansionist and so didn't really threaten this area that much to harden it. This slowed down social development and is a big reason for why Southeast Asia and Latin America both have histories in the modern world of being dominated by military dictatorships, since the only strong social institutions were the relatively weak militaries. One of the harshest things I've ever read in a history book was written about Southeast Asia in a history of Southeast Asia in which it said, both the right and the left-wing narratives of this area's history say that there was no social development between 800 and 1800 AD. The right and the left said exactly the positions you would expect them to stereotypically, where the left-wingers said that the locals had traditional folkways that didn't need to be improved, and the right due to lack of initiative on the part of the local population. But the reality is that this area actually did see a good deal of progress, it's just it happened at a slow enough pace that if you were an outsider going in and out, it would appear as if it was stagnant to you. The Portuguese showed up in the Indian Ocean in the early 16th century and with a handful of ships were shockingly able to dominate the whole region by establishing a series of strategically well-placed fortified ports. The early Europeans in this region were basically barbarians, whose main role was to steal from the wealthiest trade system in the world without really adding anything. The Europeans were also unbelievably brutal, to a much greater degree than anyone else operating in the system at the time. You have to keep in mind that these guys and the conquistadors of what kind of people would be willing to spend five months on a deadly voyage to the other side of the world in order to seize a foreign civilization. The Portuguese established forts in the coast of Southeast Asia, but the real big first European power in the region were the Dutch, who were pretty brutal but were extremely competent. The Dutch laser focus in the Indonesian spice trade, probably the most valuable trade asset in the 17th century world, conquered the Indonesian archipelago over a period of several centuries. Indonesian militaries were centuries behind European technology, but especially drill and tactics. It's always kind of hard for me to swear the Dutch as they exist now with what they were as an empire. The Dutch today seem like pretty laid-back, socialist, human rights-caring country, but in the 17th century, they were hyper-capitalist, brutal, and always scheming. There isn't a single time where you can compare a British and a Dutch colony, in which the Dutch colony came up favorably, since the Dutch were always trying to maximize short-term game. If you compare, say, the British in India, who, for all the really awful things they did, did establish that country's democracy, infrastructure, science, education, military, and unified it, the Dutch gave the Indonesians very little. On the other side of the region, we see the Philippines, named after the then King of Spain, Philip, which was colonized by the Spanish in the 16th century as a vehicle to trade with China. 
The Philippines didn't have a strong pre-existing state tradition, and so the Spanish built that. This is why I classify the Philippines as a cultural extension of Latin America, given that both were built off Spanish conquistadors trying to establish a state on top of tribal jungle peoples. A lot of the Philippines' culture fits like a glove into the Latin American world, whether between Catholic radical politics being dominated by a dozen or so partially Spanish-descended noble families, Manila looks like Mexico City, horrifying inequality and corruption, the economic progress of the countries on the same slower timescale of a Latin country rather than the faster Asian ones, and macho strongmen leaders who will claim to fix everything. If you told me about the Philippines and I didn't look at the people's genetics, I'd place it somewhere in Central America or Spanish colonies that were founded by the church as non-white colonies. The U.S. colonized the Philippines in the late 19th century, and the Americans in their weird imperialist complex were extremely generous financially with various subsidies, but due to the Americans' respect for property rights just ended up entrenching the pre-existing nobility, like the U.S. did in Cuba and the other Latin countries that it had a lot of colonial influence over. Then we get the British in Burma and the French in Indochina. In both cases, these were proud nations with millennia-old histories by the time they were colonized, and only so for less than a century. So I'm not sure how much the culture really changed except for the hill tribes often converting to Christianity. Strangely enough, often American versions of Christianity as a way to get back at the Buddhist ruling governments of the rice farming peoples. I don't like answering blanket questions like do you support immigration or colonialism, since I think these questions are extremely context-driven based off that exact situation. I don't think imperialism was positive in Southeast Asia, though. You either see extractive economies without real institutions being built, like Indonesia or the Philippines, or Europeans already taking over well-developed states like Vietnam or Burma that were basically already doing fine. In a lot of third world countries like India, for example, there's a deep psychological pathology that comes from colonialism, and that the colonized hate the colonizers, but also feel deeply inadequate to them. However, if you look at a country in the region that wasn't colonized, Thailand, there's none of this psychological block. While all of Thailand's neighbors fell to horrifying authoritarian regimes who were reacting against European colonialism due to a chip on their shoulder, Thailand, meanwhile, stayed being a pretty chill monarchy. On an unrelated basis, the colonial period and modern period saw a massive boon in trade in Southeast Asia, by both land and sea. This resulted in the mass introduction of the Chinese into the region, starting in the 17th century but reaching a fever pitch in the 19th, who may in fact be the most important ethnic group in all of Southeast Asia today. The Chinese came from strong mercantile societies and immigrated across the region, to both European colonies and native kingdoms, becoming the economic linchpins. In most countries in the region, the Chinese are less than 5% of the population, but own 70% of the wealth and businesses. I once read a history of Thailand which said that the Thai economic growth of the 18th and 19th centuries wasn't driven entirely off Chinese immigration, since we have records of there being at least a handful of Thai entrepreneurs, which is really saying something profound through omission. The Chinese have become majorities in parts of this area, with Singapore being a great example, and were very briefly a majority in the Malaya colony during the World War II era. As we all know, Singapore is one of the wealthiest states in the world, guided under the leadership of enlightened despot Lee Kuan Yew. However, the Chinese are widely hated in the region, with most native regimes after independence creating horribly discriminatory policies against their Chinese minorities, who were really the people that were driving their countries economically and intellectually, driven by envy. Southeast Asia today, I think, is one of the most intriguing and enigmatic places in the world. There's a lot of different ways you can choose to view it through, and I really don't know what the right one is. These are the kind of places where you'll see really beautiful skyscrapers that are just perfectly clean, and then you go a couple neighborhoods over and people are scrounging through the trash to find bottles so that they can get food. Southeast Asia has seen rapid economic growth over the last few decades, driven largely off low-skill industry like clothes manufacturing, but not to the same degree as the highest winners of that time, like East Asia or Eastern Europe. My guess is that this region continues to become wealthier as its population has become very hardworking, and the governments are encouraging of capitalism. I like Peter Zihan's optimistic view on this area a lot, where he points out that this is the only area in Asia, really, that has been consistently pro-capitalism in the last couple decades, 
has a stable population structure and can feed itself as well as easy water access. And so he predicts that of all the areas in Asia, Southeast Asia will have the best future. However, I don't think Southeast Asia will ever be as rich as China or Japan, who have been wealthier for their entire history, due to long-standing differences that I don't think will change. It wouldn't surprise me if something big happens in Southeast Asia, since I think something big's gonna happen across all of Asia over the next decade, but I just don't know enough about this region to confidently guess what. Also, we run into the classic thing about this area's history, that it's wedged between the titans of India and China, and so events there will kickstart something in Southeast Asia. I think these countries are natural allies of the US and the Western world, and the strategic position between the potential rivals of India and China the Southeast Asian nations could be valuable allies in whatever's about to occur. At the same time, these are cultures that are generally pretty interested and appreciative of Western culture. People who have been to Vietnam, the Philippines, or Thailand will talk about how these countries love Americans, for example. And if you go back to the early modern period, because this was such a globalized area of the world, the Asian countries that were most interested in what the West was doing were in Southeast Asia. However, the Chinese have also already been sticking out their own alliance structure in the region, returning to millennia-old precedents of the powers in the region being Chinese tributaries. Between Burma, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand becoming Chinese allies, while the others are in the American sphere. In some ways, we're seeing a line drawn between maritime and mainland Southeast Asia. How this new game will resolve, only time can tell. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Pillar, Patreon, or Pearl. As always, thanks for watching and have a wonderful day. Marquee.